Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. Since you can't come down to the grill room during this COVID-19 pandemic, we're bringing the grill room to you. Our guest today grew up in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, and being around the historic environment of Boston, he got an early interest, like at age five, in fascination with things historic in the seat of first the Industrial Revolution and then and the American Revolution. Uh, as he gradually grew up, he found himself completely fascinated by the cobblestone streets and the colonial artifacts that are all around the New England area. And by the time he was six or seven years of age, he was completely enthralled with the grit of the early colonials and what it must have taken for them to basically live in such an incredibly tough uh, seasonally brutal environment. The winters are really, really cold. The summers are really hot and humid. And he developed a fascination for this group of people who would found America. Uh, by the age of 18, he was participating in a project inside a program of historic uh, preservation uh, and was apprenticed to masters in park preservation in, uh, in the New England area. <clears throat> He became a specialist coming straight out of high school, working at eight of the national parks, including Boston and Salem and Lowell and Washington, D.C., etc., and working and creating projects in 100 of our 419 national parks across America. Um, after um, creating these experiences in three of our national parks, he was selected to become the superintendent of the San Francisco Maritime National Park. We couldn't be more proud of our local superintendent of the national parks. After 40 years of service, we got ourselves the pick of the crop, a really good pro in this field. And so David, welcome to the St. Francis Yacht Wednesday Yacht Ding Luncheon. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm uh, really happy to be here, happy to be talking to your, uh, your folks at the Yacht Club. Wish we were down at the Yacht Club today. And, uh, and I especially want to say, hey, thanks for doing all this work on your birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much, David. Tell us all about the parks. Let me tell you, uh, you know, uh, my, my plan today was to be down there doing a little show and tell with some of the very cool artifacts that we've got um, stashed away in our collections um, right down at Lower Fort Mason. Uh, but since I couldn't be there today, we're going to we're going to uh, change it up a little bit. And I've got I've got three things I want to cover today. And uh, first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the National Park Service and what we do to preserve maritime history. Uh, and I'll tell you a, a little bit about some of the uh, parks that I've worked at and um, some of the things that I've seen along the way. Um, next, uh, we will uh, get into, uh, I, I do have one particular artifact in our collections that I think is a really cool story that I learned when I got here to San Francisco. So I'll, I'll share that with you and the story behind that. And, uh, and also tell you where you can go see it live and, uh, live and in person. And then uh, finally, I'm gonna tell you about one of the most important projects that San Francisco Maritime uh, has, has undertaken and, uh, in a long time. And it's, it's really moving forward in the last couple of months. It's, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a critical piece to the park and to the San Francisco waterfront. And I thought it would be really good for everybody to know about what's going on and uh, what the plan is for the future. So <clears throat> I'll cover those. But right now, uh, I'm going to uh, pull up a uh, little screenshot here of uh, our park. And you can see... Um, you can see Muni Pier there and, and then the, and the Cove and our historic ships down there um, on the waterfront, Hyde Street Pier, uh, sort of in the center. And you can see that, um, you know, this, this location we have, uh, which is, you know, somewhere in the middle between everything from the ferry building to the Alcatraz uh, Embarkation Center along Fisherman's Wharf, uh, uh, low, uh, upper and lower Fort Mason over there to your right. Uh, right down the marina, past your yacht club, and over the Golden Gate Bridge. So, 
um, it's it's a it's quite a it's quite a waterfront, and we've got some exciting things happen happening uh, that I'm going to tell you a little bit about. But as far as the National Park Service goes, uh, I was telling Ron when I joined the service 40 years ago, there's about 270 national park sites across the country. Today there are 419 of them. And uh, our uh, organic act that established the National Park Service in 1916 um, uh, talks of our duty to conserve the scenery and our natural, historic, and, and uh, cultural sites throughout the country to preserve them for future generations. So we, <clears throat> we think of that in the sense of um, physical, uh, uh, programmatic, natural, uh, areas and and that is our uh, that is our duty and how lucky are we in the Bay Area to be situated where you can actually drive to nine of these sites in, in under an hour and uh, just to point out so that you're aware um, we are you know you're sitting right in San Francisco um, right in front of San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park Golden Gate National Recreation Area <clears throat> which I also worked in, worked at Golden Gate for uh, uh, most of the 1990s as we were transitioning the Presidio over to the National Park Service. I was a facility manager then uh, for both the, uh, the park and the Presidio. Uh, Fort Point, which I'm sure you all know where that is, uh, Muir Woods right across the bridge and uh, up the coast and further up the coast, Point Reyes National Seashore, and then over in the East Bay where we have John Muir Eugene O'Neill, Rosie the Riveter in Port Chicago. So uh, there is just so much history and uh, nature, wilderness, recreation uh, at your fingertips in the Bay Area. Um, we're very fortunate to live in a place like this. Let me tell you a little bit about a couple of the uh, places that I've uh, worked along the way and um, a, little, a little bit about them. Uh, Boston National Historical Park, I actually did two tours um, in Boston, I was the deputy superintendent there for about 10 years from 2000, well, it was actually right after 9-11, which is really interesting, to about 2010. And here you see the USS Constitution, the oldest commissioned uh, ship afloat in the world. And uh, it is still uh, run by the US Navy. They, uh, they do tours, they do programs. Um, the, the, ship, although it does belong to the U.S. Navy, it sits right in the middle of the National Park in Boston. And uh, if you could see uh, behind the masts of the uh, Constitution you see there in the picture, you'd see the USS Cassin Young, which is a Fletcher class World War II um, destroyer, um, same vintage as the USS Pampanito that's uh, docked over uh, on Fisherman's Wharf. And uh, this is technically still owned by the US Navy, but it's on permanent loan to the National Park Service. And we uh, preserve it as a, a, a floating museum and it's inspected by the Navy every year in which they tell us is one of the best preserved um, uh, ship museums in the country that they've ever seen. <clears throat> so really, uh, we have a wonderful crew of volunteers who are down there. Some of, some of the guys come down there seven days a week and they, uh, they take great care and great pride in restoring um, everything the way it used to be. And many of the, many of the volunteers um, served on ships just like this when they were in the military. Uh, if you ever get a chance to get down to Boston, head over to the Charlestown Navy Yard, check out the Constitution and, and, uh, and the Cass and Young. One of the cool things we also have in the park is our very own dry dock, which uh, saves us a lot of money when we want to do work on ships. We've brought the Cass and Young in and did a, <clears throat> some hull replacement on that about 10 years ago. Constitution was in that dry dock for about uh, two years, uh, about eight years ago. And um, it's uh, kind of a, it's a unique thing to have. You see, you see the Cass and Young uh, in the distance, just uh, on the other side of the caisson at the end of the dry dock there. And you see one of the portal cranes uh, right next to it. Um, it's, it's really a preserved the, uh, of what an old, the old Navy Yard used to be like when they were out there building ships. 
Um, one of the things uh, when I asked Ron, we were talking about what we wanted to who we wanted to present today, and Ron suggested, you know, uh, colorful stories are great. So if you have any anything to to share that you know people wouldn't know, and uh, one of the one of the stories that always uh, st stuck with me because it was it was very uh, interesting visual is I worked for an uh, electrician was my boss in the Navy Yard um, when he was you know in the military he was a, uh, it wasn't he was a civilian electrician and he would talk to me about you know life as a yard bird as they call you when you worked in the Navy Yard and uh, just outside the gate where everybody would come in everybody would go out at the end of their shifts so there was a bar there called the Blue Mirror and uh, he said at every shift change, they would uh, just line up the, the bar full of uh, whiskey shots. And uh, so all the guys coming out of their, out of the Navy Yard going home would stop in the Blue Mirror and do a shot before they would go home. And, this, and then all, all the guys coming in to do their shift would also stop into the Blue Mirror and do a shot before they went to work. So that was, that was kind of the way things happened back then. The times have changed. And... Uh, that, that uh, I, I couldn't unfortunately find any pictures of that, but it was very vivid in my memory after when he was telling me the story of that. Of that. Uh, that's that's the way uh, it's the way it used to work back then. So uh, just up the coast from Boston National Historical Park is Salem Maritime National Historic Site, and um, what a beautiful shot! That, that is a really nice shot, and uh, that is the historic uh, waterfront there in Salem. If you ever if you ever get to Salem, it's just a, a beautiful little town to walk around, and it really puts you back in the days of colonial time, much like uh, going through the um, the streets of uh, of uh, of Boston, uh, narrow cobblestone and and uh, brick buildings, and uh, it, it's just a it's it's a beautiful park. You see in the foreground there uh, a ship that is called the Friendship. It's actually a replica of a, of a ship that used to do uh, cargo trips uh, all around the country and was built in 1996 as a replica to, um, to do education programs and to sort of, um, you know, be the, uh, the real attraction to the park. And we the ship today is actually undergoing a deck replacement, so all the masts are down. We've been working with Salem, sharing uh, 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 ideas and, and, and actually staff. We, we would probably be sending some of our folks out to Salem to help them uh, uprig the ship when they're ready to put the masts back on, just because it's, it's really difficult to find people who know how to, how, you know, who have these skills as riggers. So the, the sites like San Francisco Maritime and Salem and Boston, they really network with each other and we use each other for resources. In back of the uh, ship over to the left, you see the custom house, the, the uh, brick building there is uh, another project that I've actually done some work on in the Ho Hawks house next to it. Um, the uh, the custom house is, is still has the office and a lot of the tools that Nathaniel Hawthorne used when he worked there for 10 years. And um, he would, you know, he was, he was the customs officer and would uh, make sure that everybody, you know, was you know, paying their taxes and their duties. And um, that, that, uh, that job he had there actually inspired his classic novel with Scarlet Letter. And uh <clears throat> Again, if you ever you ever get out to Salem, it's it's a it's a small park. That's that's a lot of what you see it right there. And there's a visitor center off the side, but a lot of history and uh, a, a lot of a lot of great stories. And uh, they have a wonderful education program there. And then and then once once they get the mask back on the friendship, they'll be taking that out. Now to your current home. As well. Yeah, and now taking it back home to the West Coast, um, San Francisco Maritime. And here you see a picture of the Maritime Museum with our historic ships just uh, over, the, over the top there in, in the water in the background. Um, this was a, a museum was a WPA project back in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, and as you can see, it, it uh, somewhat resembles a ship. It's a, 
It's a, a classic uh, Art Deco um, uh, representation of the, the work in, in those days. And the, the building itself and the interior of the building is really um, a, a piece of a piece of artwork in itself. I mean, we have people who come here just to see the murals inside um, the building. And uh, it, it's a pretty unique uh, operation. On the first floor, if you come in from the beach side, um, the oldest senior, the oldest, the oldest working senior center in the country uh, is still there, the senior center, and they serve uh, hundreds of people every day with uh, programs and meals and exercises and education and training and all kinds of things. It's really pretty interesting what goes on in that building. Um, David, I have to add a, a historic note for you here. This building also was the site, that roof that you're looking at right now, was the site of a welcoming party for the second boat created by San Francisco's first America's Cup Challenge. In June of 1986, I know that's a long time ago, we held a public reception here in your aquatic park, and we, we staged a big VIP party right on that roof you're looking at right now, which has, for those who haven't been on that roof, one of the most spectacular views in San Francisco shoreline. And uh, we had our two America's Cup boats inside the harbor right in view of what you're looking at in this picture right here. We had the newest uh, boat uh, christened, and we had the the earlier, a couple months older boat, 49, come sail in. And the skipper of that boat, Paul Kayard, was just this last month um, inducted into the Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame. He became the first sailor inducted in the Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame. So this building was put to good historic use for the first challenge for the America's Cup from San Francisco. So uh, thanks for taking great care of it all these years. Yeah, oh, you're welcome. That's uh, that's our job. We got to make sure our grandkids are going to be able to do the same thing when they're growing up. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll uh, let me introduce you to a couple of our famous uh, characters at the park. Uh, probably our flagship. Most people um, like to come down and and see the Balclutha. This is a steel hull, steel hull, square rigged um, schooner that uh, carried a variety of cargo. Um, uh, all, all up and down the coast, and um, in its in its first um, in its first life, and after they kind of wore out uh, the Belclutha as a cargo ship, uh, it was bought by the Alaskan Packing Company and uh, made regular trips up to Alaska, uh, bringing salmon back. And if you go on the Belclutha today, uh, you go below decks. Um, there are uh, exhibits and educational uh, uh, exhibits uh, that show you the whole history of what she uh, what she transported over the years and you'll see some uh, fascinating footage of the Balclutha underway in some uh, pretty hair-raising uh, uh, trips it took and I don't know how they took those pictures but you, know, you got sailors up there climbing mast and waves breaking over the bow. Uh, it's, it took a took a special person to uh, want to be part of that uh, lifestyle. But uh, I, I would highly recommend you get out there and take a look at that. It was, it's really fascinating. And we do a lot of educational programs on the Balclutha with our park association. Um, the Age of Sail has been going on, I believe, for 40 years. And it's amazing how many people I bump into in San Francisco that said, oh, yeah, I did that program when I was a kid. They, they spend the night and they, you know, they sleep on the decks and uh, below decks and they get up at night and have to do their watch at two o'clock in the morning and learn what it was like to be a, a sailor back in the day. So I have to add another historic point. So as a little boy, as a 12, 13, 14 year old, in the Sea Scout base, we actually had a couple of our kids, a guy named Stan Halverson and a few others, came over and used to put tar rigging and wrap the rigging on the Balclutha. Mm -hmm. And um, most people don't realize this was a this is a pretty significant boat, 301 feet length overall, with a mass 14 stories tall, it draws 23 feet. Um, this was quite an impressive creature. And as a young boy, 
we would sail around it in small boats and look up at it mm. admiringly because it's a, it's a genuine creature. As yeah. you know, it uh, made 16 trips around Cape Horn, the tip of South America. That's a significant yeah. ship. If you, if you can yeah. take 16 trips over what many consider one of the roughest pieces of water in the world, Valclude's got a real history. Yeah, and it's interesting to think, uh, you know, when they, when they built ships like this, that that's pretty much what it was built for. This, these things were not built to last. Uh, you know, 50 years. These, these things were built to run their, uh, run their race and, and, you know, do their trips. And after, you know, after uh, five, 10 years in the business, that's done. You know, the, 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 these were uh, almost thought of as of dispensable. You know, you use them up and then you build another ship and do the same thing. So it's incredible. Um, you know, the, the, the lifespan that this that this has had and uh, i don't have to tell any of you who own a boat it's not it's not cheap to keep these things up and keep them afloat and keep them looking looking like they do in the, in good condition so the next ship i'll uh, introduce you to is the eureka this is a uh, the largest wooden uh ship uh in the country is still afloat and although she needs a little bit of work, um, we're actually in the process of uh, doing some planning and uh, spec work to get her into dry dock and uh, get some work done on her next year. Uh, the Eureka used to carry um, uh, cargo and passengers and even trains uh, from Hyde Street Pier over to Tiburon and Sausalito. Trains would roll up into the Eureka on tracks and then uh, dock on the other side and be on its way. If you go onto the Eureka today, you can see a lot of uh, sort of uh, some of the things that are in our collection that are actually stored on the Eureka, antique vehicles and cargo. And um, so it's a nice, uh, it's a nice ship to walk the decks and, uh, you know, you look at all of the seats and can imagine really what it was like back in the day to have a ship full of passengers going back and forth. Of course, before there was any Golden Gate Bridge, this was this is how you got there. This is how you did it. Um, and right next to her is the uh, Hercules, which is a uh, steam ocean tug. Did a lot of work around the Bay Area in its day. And uh, that is actually heading into dry dock next year. I believe we're going to uh, replace some of the metal frames on it. We have a really cool steam engine inside there that is um, you know, meticulously cared for by uh, our staff and some volunteers. We still blow the whistle uh, once, a, once a month or so, and, and we're trying to convert the fuel on that now so we can run, it, run the steam engine more often uh, and uh, be able to show people uh, how that thing worked. On, uh, right on the other side of the dock is uh, Eppleton Hall. And that is a, a paddle uh, tug uh, built in England and actually uh, uh, sailed over from England on its own power when they brought it here um, years ago. Um, the uh, Epi also needs a little bit of TLC, as you can see, but uh, I believe this is the last surviving um, uh, paddle wheel tug in the world from what I've been able to research on. The, uh, the one that you've probably seen the most, if you've seen it out sailing around past your yacht club, is our uh, flat bottom scow, the Alma. And the Alma um, did a lot of trips around the Delta in the Bay Area and would carry uh, everything from uh, hay to lumber to cargo uh, in and around from San Francisco Bay into the Delta. It was a flat bottom boat. So, you know, when it was, when it was uh, in the Delta and tides were up and down, it would just sit in the mud until it had to continue on its way. And we use that ship a lot now to do education programs, uh, to have our volunteers do training on. We do some public sales with them. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, school kids come out on the Alma and do programs with our association. And it, uh, I've even seen it up here in Petaluma, where I live. It usually comes up once a year and comes up the Petaluma River and visits during uh, uh, a little celebration weekend we have here called Rivertown Revival. So um, 
it's going to be uh, it's going to be a slow year for the Alma because of uh, a lot of the things that have been closed and shut down. But we do hope to get her out a couple times, and hopefully, you'll be seeing her uh, come by this summer. And uh, now I want to I want to share with you one of the artifacts that uh, that I was introduced to when I first came here to San Francisco Maritime. I, I should mention that. Uh, San Francisco Maritime has the largest collection in the National Park Service. Uh, artifacts, archives, um, uh, we have over 35,000 uh, books in our library, uh, dating back from the 1500s. Ship logs, uh, papers, collections, tools, uh, boats, pieces of boats, photographs, and our research center, which has a beautiful library in it, by the way, is right down at Lower Fort Mason in Building E. People can actually go there, uh, make an appointment, uh, and work with somebody to do research. And um, uh, you can get copies of, uh, of papers, copies of pictures. If you're working on anything in particular, um, they, we've got a great staff there that can um, help you uh, find what you need. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to show you uh, something that's in our collection that was, uh, that really piqued my curiosity because as a young, uh, young boy, I always wondered what the significance of, of this was. And I'm, I'm showing you here this picture of the uh, German castle, which was a public observatory and restaurant on Telegraph Hill. Uh, this picture is somewhere uh, around uh, eight, in the late 1800s. And what, uh, what I want to show you is the ball that's on top of the pole on top of that building. And that's a time ball. The time balls uh, were, were invented in England in 1830s. And the, the purpose of this was that every day at noon, uh, the ball would drop. And when it hit the bottom of the pole, it was 12 o'clock noon. And you would see these uh, from many vantage points around the port, the harbor, and the city. And that's how everybody set the, you know, the ships would set their chronometers. Uh, so, and, and people would set their timepieces. And that's how everybody, you know, kept sort of kept pace of time and knew that they were you know, they were all synchronized. So you can imagine in the old days, everybody waiting for this thing to happen, you know, looking at their, their timepieces and, um, you know, the, all of a sudden the ball starts to drop and as soon as it hits the bottom, it's 12 noon. Um, Could be a one minute, one minute uh, trip down the pole? Uh, well, that's what we're thinking. And the only reason that's my theory is because that's what happens at Times Square, right? Every, every year, when they drop the ball to signify the uh, end of the old year and the beginning of the new year, it starts down the pole at 11.59 and then it hits the bottom. And I remember as a kid asking my grandparents when we used to watch, whenever you, many of you know, remember uh, Guy Lombardo at the uh, Waldorf Astoria. And I used to watch that show every year with my grandparents and the ball would drop. And I'm like, I used to ask them, what, what is the ball? What does that mean? Why is, you know, What's the significance of that? What is and and they didn't know, <laughs> and uh, and that's what it it's, that's what happened. It started in England in the 1830s, and then these things popped up all over the world in harbors, uh, in towns, and uh, there's still a few surviving ones around. the The first one that came to San Francisco was in 1852, on top of this building, and it was later moved to um, the ferry building. And it was on the ferry building up until uh, from 1898 to 1907. So in 1907, uh, they said, "Well, we're gonna we're gonna do another one. We're gonna do a better one, um, and and it's 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 gonna be more prominent." And they placed this new time ball up on top of the Fairmont Hotel. And, and the, the ball was in use in the, in the Fairmont Hotel until 1937. That's the last time that it was used. And, you know, technology sort of replaced the time ball. It didn't need a time ball anymore. So they stopped using it. And about 20 years later, when they go up there to do some work on the roof, they discover this thing. 
say, oh, geez, hey, this, we, what are we going to do with this? With, with this time ball? Well, they donated it. Uh, back in 1953, they donated it to the Maritime Museum. So if you go to the Maritime, if you go to our visitor center, which is down on Jefferson Street in the Argonaut Hotel, uh, there you see the time ball uh, that used to sit on top of the uh, Fairmont Hotel. Uh, that's, that is the ball that used to drop and uh, tell us what time it was. And I, uh, I thought that that was just a fascinating story. That'll come up, that'll help you in a Trivial Pursuit game one of these days. <laughs> ask you, what is a time ball for? I don't even know what that is. So incidentally, when they moved the, that from uh, from the ferry building over to the Fairmont Hotel. That was also the same time. That was the first time they, they uh, dropped the ball in Times Square uh, in 1907, 1908. So that was the first time they had that big uh, ceremony. All right, well, I wanna, I wanna move on to um, something uh, we bring you up to modern day as to what's happening in the park right now and you're all familiar with Muni Pier, kind of iconic uh, pier that wraps around and hugs the harbor and protects the cove and the beach and the ships that we have. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about something that's going on right now at, right in your backyard and that is a grassroots movement to bring public awareness to what is going on with Muni Pier and the need to replace this pier. It's been, on the, it's been on the list of projects for the National Park Service for many years. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, obviously a big uh, price tag on it. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, it hasn't uh, really gotten the attention it needs. And this organization, which is Aquatic Park Pier Project, um, is, is uh, put together to really raise awareness and to uh, to work with the the people of San Francisco and our community and our neighbors to provide a, a public forum to imagine you know what this place could be if we bring this back if we restore the pier and we we breathe some life into this uh, area of aquatic park that is really the center of so many things happening where Fisherman's Wharf ends, where the Lower Van Ness uh, transportation hub of the city uh, uh, terminates and the connection over to Lower Fort Mason and Upper Fort Mason then and then on to the marina. Um, I'm sure you all know there's a tunnel that goes from Aquatic Park over to Lower Fort Mason. Um, that's another thing that folks are looking at to see if that's gonna be something that is, uh, uh, brought back to life. But if you take a close look at Muni Pier today, uh, you, you can see it's, it's in uh, quite disrepair and there are uh, a lot of uh, sections of Muni Pier that are actually closed off to the public right now. And uh, if, if we don't get this project the attention it needs, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna be, have to close off more of it. But the group that is actually being incubated uh, by the uh, our park association, San Francisco Maritime National Park Association. Um, and I think many of you know Charlie Hart and uh, the, this, this organization is incubating this, this group and uh, helping them raise money to develop a vision study so that we can bring people together, uh, to, again, to imagine what could happen in the, in the uh, possibilities of recreation and education, maritime history, um, transportation, access, uh, easy access for pedestrians. Uh, so we are uh, gonna be launching a public uh, outreach program this summer. Hope to have the vision study done by early next year. And uh, some of the keys again is, is to, you know, take all of the resources that are already there, our museum, our visitor center, our pro programmatic connections between uh, San Francisco Maritime and Golden Gate National Recreation Area. We have a lot of folks that are on board with this project and we have been working pretty closely with the city of San Francisco uh, who has already put aside $100,000 for this project. And uh, you can see the study area here, uh, which is our park, 
aquatic park. Uh, Fort Mason Center is on board with this, um, the Golden Gate National Recreation Area and the uh, park, Golden Gate Parks Conservancy, um, the Port Authority, City of San Francisco. So this whole area is being looked at for um, how to enhance transportation, uh, communication, education, um, and, and make this really a world-class waterfront that is, is recognized uh, more than, you know, the pieces that it is now, the, the different pieces. Um, so we have, uh, we have a lot of the documentation in, in, uh, in being put together right now to bring on a, a consultant. Our project manager is Kathy Barner. Some of you may know Kathy from the Golden Gate Parks Conservancy. And uh, she has worked on projects from Chrissy Field to Fort Baker and Presidio um, uh, right up until the time she had left um, uh, the Conservancy. I've worked with uh, Kathy for many years when I was at Golden Gate and even uh, back in Boston when she did some work uh, for the parks out there. So she's, uh, she's championing this, uh, uh, this effort and uh, uh, our, our fundraising is underway. And uh, the uh, key thing that has probably happened in the last couple of months is this group has gotten the city to apply uh, for a, uh, uh, a funding through Senator Feinstein's office for a $17 million package to start the design uh, for the replacement of the pier. The, the thinking behind this is there's a, a lot of talk about a potential stimulus program uh, that could be happening in the near future, uh, much like uh, around 2009, 2010, if you remember ERA, where we were, um, you know, sort of have this economic stimulus work plan. Um, the, uh, you know, having Muni Pier ready with plans and specs sitting on the shelf would be a very attractive project uh, for somebody to fund where you could just start um, uh, putting people to work and, uh, and, and, and doing some good for the community. Uh, and hopefully the vision study will bring this, uh, these activities to light and, and will you know, get the community energized and behind this. So I would uh, encourage each of you to learn more about it, to participate, certainly when we start doing our public meetings and uh, workshops, uh, it would be great to see you there and to hear what your ideas would be. Um, so I would say if anybody is interested in more of that, you can certainly talk to Charlie about it. You can talk to me about it. Uh, if you know Kathy Barner, she's again our, our uh, uh, project manager. But um, it, it's a really exciting project. I think if it's ever going to happen, it's going to happen now with the people we have, uh, you know, in our in our our our, our government seats right now. Um, it's got to happen right now. So I think it's it's poised for uh, success if we keep this thing going. Um, I'm going to end it there, and I'm going to thank you all for having me today, and uh, thanks for tuning in. Thank you for watching. I'm uh, thrilled to be here. I'm just down the street at Lower Fort Mason, and um, love to uh, uh, keep up the uh, relationship and chat with you again. Ron, thank you very much for having me today. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun telling the stories. I don't get to do this too often. I'm not no television star, but uh, it was fun to do this with you. Thanks very much, David. Leave that slide up for a sec because I want to ask a question. As you may know, I was recently elected to the board of the um, San Francisco Maritime National Park Association. And I keep thinking that the, what we, we would really help the park would be to connect the Chrissy Field a pathway and the Marina Green to downtown the ferry building. And on, the, on this slide right now, you can see that if you walked from the Golden Gate Bridge eastward to the Marina Green and past Marina Green to Fort Mason, we could just walk either through the tunnel or around, exactly, around this edge on the shoreline side of the ferry of uh, Fort Mason, we could connect to Aquatic Park. And that would enable all the merchants in Fisherman's Wharf and Pier 39 and 
and down all the way as far as the ferry building to connect to, um, you know, the Marina District, the Marina District merchants, and um, basically have a boulevard where people could walk all the way from the Golden Gate Bridge to the ferry building and really even beyond that down to Pactel Park. This might help highlight the genuine maritime heritage of San Francisco. Most people don't realize, but uh, by 1850, a uh, year after the famous uh, 1849er, um, you know, invasion of uh, San Francisco by gold rush interested uh, pioneers from all over the world, most don't realize that half of the population of San Francisco got here by coming through the Golden Gate Bridge in a square rigger. So everybody here knew how to sail and this whole shoreline was filled with boats. In fact, the far view of the financial district, all the tall buildings, there were so many ships and boats there that as uh, you well know, uh, they began to be the first edge of what is now um, Montgomery Street and Sansom Street and Front and so on. Boats were uh, chock a block there and that maritime heritage of San Francisco is genuine. So what a great way to celebrate it and to have your park system right here in Aquatic Park in the middle of the path all the way from the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, to the ferry building. So thanks for keeping this slide up while we can talk about this feature. Uh, now I got a couple questions. If we flip that slide off so I can get a big view of you. Um, tell me, uh, what is the national budget for the national park system? How big is that budget? <laughs> Boy, uh, you, you're, you're uh... You're, you're testing me here. Well, I can tell you that, uh, let me start with my park. Uh, our park is, uh, has a budget of $7.7 .7 million. Um, that, that's a, actually a good size for a park. Um, you, you get up to the bigger parks, Golden Gate, Yosemite, you're in the $50 million range, and then you're into the money that they're gonna collect from fees. So there, there are uh, base appropriations, there is uh, fee money that parks collect, uh, that help do projects, which, by the way, right now, uh, parks are suffering. I mean, they're, they were, uh, you know, parks like Yosemite, Yellowstone, that were projecting millions and millions of dollars uh, from now to the end of the year and had, you know, staff to hire and projects to do. It's all gone. You know, that's, it's all out the window now. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, sort of recalculating going on in parks right now, figuring out what they're going to do without fees. I actually don't have that number off the top of my head of what the total budget is for the National Park Service. Um, but we are, uh, it, when you look at the whole uh, uh, government spending, and we, we fall within the Department of the Interior, we're a, very, we're a sliver of, um, of, you know, what we, other, other programs that are funded by the, uh, by the government. What's the number of attendees who come to the San Francisco Maritime National Park annually? So we have a, a annual visitation uh, in the neighborhood of 4 million people. Um, 4 million people at San Francisco Maritime, that's you know, Aquatic Park. If you look uh, just uh, uh, to the west of us at Golden Gate National Recreation Area, they're in the, I believe, 12 million uh, range. Of course, they have lands, you know, north of the bridge and then south down into San, San Mateo also. So give us a sense about where you are in the, where, where the park system in San Francisco Maritime is in the org chart. So what, where do you guys in the, in the San Francisco Maritime, who do you report up to? Give me the line from you up to the White House. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very long line. So up to me up to the White House. So I've actually the, um, uh, the, regional office for all of the parks in the west uh well we, we we used to be called the pacific west region now uh, uh that the new administration has realigned all of the agencies so that all of our regions are similar so the park service blm uh, bureau of indian affairs all of the folks have now the same borders where we used to uh, all have different borders, but we're in the Pacific West region. Our headquarters is in San Francisco, downtown in the financial district on Bush Street. And uh, so I report to the regional office there. There are uh, eight regions uh, that uh, roll up to Washington. Uh, there are some support offices in some of the uh, uh, cities. We have support office in Seattle, support office in Boston. So 
when we consolidated regions years ago, which used to have 10 consolidated those. And uh, so it goes you know, from a park to the regional office, to the Washington office, um, to the Secretary of the Interior. So what's the staff of the San Francisco Maritime National Park? So we have approximately, depending on, uh, you know, summer and seasonals and guides we hire, we have approximately 70 to 80 employees. Um, we have uh, interpretive rangers and, and you know, we, we in the Park Service call interpretive rangers. Everybody thinks, oh, they, they speak different languages, but they're uh, sort of the, those are the folks, the, the rangers you see on the front line behind the information desk giving tours. Um, those are the, in, those are the uh, interpretive rangers. Uh, and we have the facility staff, and that's um, made up of, in this park in particular, is riggers, um, maintenance workers, um, skilled trades. Uh, we have a uh, museum staff, um, obviously, again, with the, with the largest collection in the National Park Service, we have a, 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 quite, a, quite a staff compared to some parks. Uh, with curators and uh, library technicians, uh, conservators. Uh, we have a preservation staff that um, focuses on historic preservation, preservation of ships, uh, and administrative staff. Uh, and um, we don't, <clears throat> whereas most people have uh, law enforcement rangers, you know, see those will be the gun carrying rangers that uh, uh, do visitor services and law enforcement. We receive that service from uh, Golden Gate and the park police. So uh, our, our headquarters office is down in building E at Lower Fort Mason. And we have our collections on the first floor, our administrative offices for the park and our association on the second floor, and our library and our archives on the third floor. All of the big items that we have in collections are in a, a very large warehouse over in San Leandro. So uh, when somebody wants to come visit the park, um, they go to Hyde Street Pier is one location right at the western edge of Fisherman's Wharf with mm -hmm. the Argonaut Hotel, which would be Hyde Street and Jefferson, if I got that right? Hyde Street and Jefferson, correct. And so then they can walk out the pier and as they walk out the pier, describe for uh, potential visitors, what they'll see as they walk out the pier, out Hyde Street Pier, which is your historic pier. Right. So when you walk out, you walk out to Hyde Street Pier, the first thing you're going to pass by um, is our one of our uh, shops, uh, one of our boat shops, and that's actually uh, we leave it open so people can see what the what the uh, crew is working on and if they are working on something at the time, in the shop in particular. Um, you'll sort of see the carpenter shop there and just, you, you, you can actually talk to the people and what are you making? Uh, right beyond that is what we call the small boat shop where we might have somebody working on some um, uh, smaller crafts uh, under, the, under the roof there so you can actually see something happening there. Uh, there's a little shop where we have some volunteers work. Uh, once a week we get a crew of volunteers who come in and then, uh, and then you'll uh, you'll be heading up to the Eureka and then heading down Hyde Street Pier, you hit all of the other ships, the Thayer, the Balclutha, uh, the Hercules. And then down below, actually one of the things that I, I didn't show you is we have, we have quite a collection of small boats that are in the water down there, about 10 or so. And uh, those are in the water and floating. And then of course we have a, a very large collection of smaller boats over in, the, in our storage in San Leandro. And you have an arc too. Talk a little bit about you have a, an arc. Yeah, that. yeah. It's um, it's it's a little kind of houseboat that used to, I I believe it used to be in Sausalito, and you walk through it, and it's almost like walking through, uh, you know, somebody's little cabin, a uh, little floating cabin. Uh, so that's actually right on the that's that's right on the pier as uh, as you come through the gate on your right hand side. So essentially, you guys are maintaining the boats themselves and the ships, this whole collection right there on the pier. Essentially, the pier is like a museum with floating craft. And you said this is the largest collection of maritime museum objects in the national park system. Not, not only maritime, but any, anything, any collection that any park has, doesn't matter what it is, we have the largest collection of, of, of uh, 
artifacts and papers and books and, and yeah. And so everything that you see on the pier is part of the collection. The ships are part of the collection. All the vehicles that are on the Eureka are part of the collection. Um, so you're seeing that stuff. So I love the fact that they, you have kind of one of each of these unique vessels, the Hercules, mm -hmm. steam powered. Mm -hmm. So how did they create the steam on the Hercules? And I got to also say, I did a little research and I learned that the Hercules actually towed a sister ship around Cape Horn. Yeah. And those of us who know about the Straits of Magellan and the tip of South America know that that is really, really a tough area. I referred earlier to the Valclutha having more than a dozen trips around Cape Horn. Yeah. But the Hercules herself didn't just go around Cape Horn, she towed another sister ship around Cape Horn. So how do they power the steam power? How's the steam, how's the fire created that helps create the steam boilers? Well, we have, you know, it's, it's uh, oil fired right now. And that's why I, one of the things I was uh, explaining about it is we're trying to, um, we're trying to uh, uh, engineer uh, uh, the, the ship so that we can burn a cleaner fuel um, so that we can run it more often and, and not have to worry about what we're emitting, e emitting into the air. But you can actually go into the Hercules and go down below and, and see this engine run. So what we do now is rather than uh, power it with steam and having to uh, turn on the engines, we have an air compressor on the, on, uh, on the deck uh, on, on the pier and we run air through it so that you can hear the whistle blow and you can see how it runs. But um, we have a, a volunteers and crew who, uh, like as I say, they, they, they care for that thing and they do maintenance on it and it's meticulous and you can see it. You can see how everything operates. Um, I believe we have I want to say uh, uh, is once a month when we uh, 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 you know blow the whistle on it, and once a once a week we have uh, volunteers who come on board and uh, do a lot of the maintenance on it. And you can you know you can talk to those folks. We have an interpreter who's usually around the ship and can give you some personal attention and get you up close and personal with uh, everything on the ship. Most people don't realize that scows, there were lots of scows in the San Francisco Bay Area and especially uh, trading up and back and forth up to the Delta, which has got lots of shallow water. San Pablo Bay, mm -hmm. Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers have very shallow spaces. And yet a scow is very wide with a flat bottom. There even was a sandbagger sloop race that used to have scows that sailed back and forth from Sausalito, San Francisco with races mm -hmm. where people actually gambled on which was the fastest scow. <laughs> so um, I've seen as a, as a yachtsman myself in San Francisco Bay for uh, over half a century, we see the Alma out all the time. She's quite an ambassador yeah. for your park system. Yeah. So when people want to come down to visit the Pampanito, don't you manage the Pampanito as well? No, actually the Pampanito is owned by uh, the San Francisco Maritime Park Association but it is separate. Uh, it really has nothing to do with the national park, with our park. So okay. uh, it, it, you know, the, the um, association does tours on the Pampanito. Well, you know, not right now, but when it gets back to it. Um, and I think they're actually going to start doing uh, some overnights. They were talking about doing some overnight education programs on it. So the Pampanito is, uh, a, again, a sort of the World War II era submarine and uh, it's over by the association offices on Fisherman's Wharf, separate, um, separate from the ships in uh, San Francisco Maritime. So they are not part of the National Park Service. I got you, but you get a sp support from the association yes. and the yes. association gets revenue from tours on the Pampanito. Exactly, right? that's how that works. Exactly. And so what about, what was there any damage to the park when the big fire happened on the uh, Professional Fisherman's Wharf? No, for, fortunately not. Um, we had to close the beach for a little while uh, for, for the day, mostly because of uh, the water quality. But the fire that um, burned, which is the warehouse right next to the Pampanito and the Jeremiah O'Brien, uh, fortunately didn't, um, didn't affect uh, either one of those ships 
or any of the administrative offices uh, that our association has down on that pier, but I believe the pier's closed now. They're moving the Jeremiah O'Brien, I think over to 35. Um, so that's gonna be gone while they're doing a lot of the uh, repair work of the fire. I still don't know how that started or what the, what the story was behind it, but we were fortunate not to, <laughs> that thing not to take off more than it did. You know, a lot of people don't uh, realize that if you draw a line from Van Ness straight down to the waterfront, it comes right to your park, to Aquatic Park. And then if you draw a line up Columbus uh, from downtown area where the Transamerica is to Columbus, that also it makes a diagonal line right to Aquatic Park. So you're ideally suited to represent the maritime heritage of San Francisco. And I've spent time researching in your library in Fort Mason. So I, I think of the San Francisco Maritime National Park as a really a, a underdiscovered uh, charm in the city of San Francisco. And I wanna encourage uh, uh, people to go down to the Maritime Museum, which is an absolute treasure built in the 30s, as you said, perfect Art Deco building and uh, Aquatic Park and go out on pier uh, the High Street Pier, I mean, holy cow, a pier is a kind of a living museum with ships and boats in the water is a really unique, wonderful way to celebrate the maritime heritage of San Francisco. And David, thank you so much for taking care of our national, of our component of the national park system. The San Francisco Maritime National Park wouldn't be as much of a treasure without your, your, uh, your care and uh, supervision. So as the superintendent of it, uh, we want to thank you very much for your good service to us and for being a guest at the St. Francis Yacht Club Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thank you so much for uh, coming and telling us about the park. It was my pleasure, Ron. Thank you again for the uh, invitation. I appreciated it. I had a good time. And uh, go and say, uh, go and have yourself a happy birthday now. Thanks very much, David. All right. That will adjourn the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.